Disclaimer. The following part of the Atlantis film series contains wild speculation, personal musings, theoretical postulations, fantasy, and has very little to do with Atlantis until the very end, when it will be revealed it has everything to do with Atlantis, if it's not all a complete pile of utter bollocks. Please take it with an open mind and a dump truck full of salt. As above, so below. As the macrocosm, so the microcosm. Man is created in God's image. Meet the microcosmic Allah. Arm, leg, leg, arm, head. Allah, God, you. Bro, Bro don't, don't you blaspheme in here or I'll, or I'll smash, smash these, these plates, plates over your head. head. Patience, Moses. You'll like where this is going. In 1960, David Latimer lowered one seed into compost in a bottle, watered it, and sealed it. He only added water once more in 1972, and his tree is still alive to this day, 60 years later, last watered 48 years ago. Recently, a story has been going around that a massive root system four miles deep and four to seven miles in diameter was found under Devil's Tower, Wyoming, claiming it to be an ancient massive tree. While Reuters has fact-checked the source and cannot find any credibility to this story, there are in fact hundreds of well-researched videos and articles on the internet postulating that these thousands of tabletop mountains, plains, and plateaus around the earth are exactly that petrified stumps of ancient trees of a size we cannot possibly fathom today. My poor thirsty dying aloe plant got me thinking and begged me to research. How much water does a tree need every week or every year for that matter? Clearly I don't know but apparently a general rule of thumb is to apply 10 gallons of water for every inch of tree trunk diameter once a week if there is no outside natural source of water. If one of the smaller tabletop mountains like Devil's Tower were once a tree with a diameter of 923 feet or roughly 11,000 inches, 
It would require at least 111,000 gallons of water each week, or roughly 5,800,000 gallons of fresh water every year. One of the bigger ones, like Table Mountain in Cape Town, South Africa, with a diameter of 2.3 miles, or 145,000 inches, would require at least 1,451,000 gallons of water a week, or roughly 75,452,000 gallons of fresh water every year. Now there are literally thousands of these things all around the world, and one could imagine an ancient world much like the movie Avatar, only with trees much, much bigger than that movie. But where would all of the water come from to keep these trees alive? Trees cannot live on the salt water of our oceans and seas. Many of the ancient cosmologies depict their belief in our world as an enclosed terrarium, resting on or perhaps floating on a giant foundation of what might be a pure fresh water table, a perfect source and delivery system for the hundreds of trillions of gallons of fresh water it would have taken for thousands of trees of such magnitude to grow, live, and thrive in. Many of these mesas and tabletop mountains have giant waterfalls pouring either off of them or out of the sides of them, but have no lake on top and are too flat to collect any amount of water or rain of such volume. So where is the water coming from? If you've ever chopped down a tree or removed a tree branch, you'll notice it can still leak root sap and water for months to even years after it's been cut down. By coincidence, these tabletop mountains seem to have the same growth rings we find in trees. All over the world, massive ancient tunnel systems have been discovered underneath mountains, stretching unimaginable vast distances. Archaeologists are dumbfounded as to how on earth our ancestors could have dug all of these tunnels and why they would have done it. Today, we have modern advanced technological maser drilling machines to make our deep underground military bases and our tunnel systems, even for trains and undersea motor vehicle tunnels. But how then did the ancients dig them with these primitive tools? Well, what if they didn't? What if they are simply nothing more than the underground root systems from ancient trees of a size we cannot even comprehend? In Wisconsin today, we find the bizarre legend of the titanic giant Paul Bunyan with his giant axe and his titanic ox babe. Now, there are giants and then there are titans, not to be mistaken for each other.
You see, if these tabletop mountains were actually giant trees, they appear to have been purposefully and skillfully chopped down by someone of the size, stature, and likes of the legendary Paul Bunyan and his axe, and then hauled away by his titanic ox babe, or even perhaps something else of the likes. But that sounds ludicrous, unless, of course, we believe the ancients had some kind of technologically advanced gear machinery that was able to undertake a task such as chopping down a mountain-sized tree, which seems laughable. Uh, er, at least a little bit. Are you you tripping tripping on manna manna from from heaven? heaven? This This story story is starting starting to sound sound a little unbelievable. unbelievable. Giant Giant mountain-sized titans? titans. Bollocks, I say! say. Well, that's funny you would say that, Moses, as the Jewish Talmud embellishes the story of your own fight with the giant Og, stating that Og was so large that he sought the destruction of your Israelites by uprooting a mountain so large that it would have crushed your entire Israelite encampment. The Lord caused a swarm of ants to dig away at the center of the mountain, which was resting on Og's head, and then the mountain fell onto Og's shoulders. As Og attempted to lift the mountain off himself, the Lord caused Og's teeth to lengthen outward, becoming embedded in the mountain that was now surrounding his head. And allegedly you, Moses, fulfilling the Lord's injunction not to fear him, seized a stick of 10 cubits length or 15 feet, perhaps an electromagnetic fascist weapon, and jumped a similar vertical distance in the air, succeeding in striking Og in the ankle, and Og fell down and died upon hitting the ground. That's That's right, right. I fried fried his his dumb dumb ugly ass ass real real good. Or... Is this a metaphor for something happening in the astrological age of the Golden Bull Taurus or Babe the Ox? Of which you told Aaron's people to stop worshipping, which killed and petrified the Titans on this earth. When I traveled Sumatra in early 2005, we were excited to get to the bustling, thriving hippie village of Bukit Lawang that the Lonely Planet and our friends who had been there previously had raved about. The problem was, when we got there, there was no more Bukit Lawang. Excessive logging in Banda Aceh, over 237 miles away, had created a flood the year before that wiped out the entire village over one horrific night, leaving only two hilltop hotels and the orangutan reserve. It was as if the place had never existed. Trees and shrubs soak up water and keep our soil sturdy. On a world scale, What would happen to the soil if thousands of two to even ten mile high trees were to be cut down and logged? And where would all of the underground water go that was normally soaked up by these trees? In fact, all around the world, and the northern parts especially, we find a strange phenomenon called circle lakes, table lakes, or sometimes crater lakes, that look as if they were once giant tree trunks that have either been blown down by the wind or literally ripped out by the roots and left a giant fresh groundwater puddle. The strange legend of Paul Bunyan comes from Wisconsin and Minnesota, the land of 10,000 lakes, where many of these circle lakes can be found. In fact, on the other side of the world in Norway, Finland, and Sweden, also known for their many lakes, we find the same thing in their mythologies. 
tales of trolls, ice giants, titans, gods, or creatures larger than mountains carrying enormous trees as clubs, swords or axes, etc. And one has to wonder at the origins of such mythologies. Is it possible that there really were giant titanic humanoids who did the same thing we little humanoids do? Cut down the one thing on this planet that was soaking up the groundwaters from below to use for whatever reasons we ourselves use wood and trees for. Shelter, vehicles, tools, fire, etc. And that these titans caused their own demise via great groundwater flooding? The Bible speaks of the seven rivers, which we know is a metaphoric parable for the seven churches of God, the seven chakras, the seven colors of the rainbow electromagnetic spectrum, seven major notes of the music scale, the seven trumpets of revelation, seven seals of revelation, the seven major systems of the human body and flowering plants, seven major visible planets, seven alleged continents, seven in numerology, seven days of the week, and on and on. But where did the original river analogy for these metaphors come from? Could it be that before the world was covered in predominantly ocean instead of land, there once only was seven rivers on the earth? As bizarre as it sounds, all of the world maps that we have that predate the alleged year 800 of our good Lord suggest something not too far off from that. Now one might argue that that was as big as they thought their world was back then, but they all seem to think the world was a circle with a giant river of water surrounding it, as if it was sitting in some giant crater. And then we have the Dark Ages, and nobody seems to be making any credible world maps for nearly 500 years after 800. Even 700 years later, when we get the Montes 1587 planisphere, we get the same theme. What happened? As to what any of this has even remotely anything to do with Atlantis, the line of thought that we're following here is to question. Do sea levels rise and fall, or do land masses rise and sink in a stable sea level? And if so, how and why? Well, why do helium or hydrogen balloons float in the air? Because they are lighter than air, as is methane gas, which is found in abundance below the earth and the oceans, and is most controversial these days with fracking. But why? And what is a gas lighter than air even doing in abundance under our earth in the first place? As it turns out, trees emit a surprisingly large amount of methane. Forest scientists have long amused their students by cutting holes in tree bark and setting fire to the gases hissing from the trunk. University of Kansas cut a campus cottonwood and found the gas coming off was 60% methane. They found a consistent story that the trees all emit a lot of methane. In the seasonally flooded part of the Amazon, and I repeat flooded, the trees become a massive chimney for the pumping out of methane. Emissions from individual trees were more than 200 times higher than any previously measured anywhere. Every hectare of flooded forest was emitting several kilos of methane each day, and the on-the-ground findings doubled the previous estimates of Amazon methane emissions to around 40 million tons a year. The trees were emitting as much methane gas as all of the tundra ecosystems of the Arctic, whose permafrost contains huge amounts of the gas, a store that is expected to be released in ever greater quantities as the region warms and its soils thaw. 
Now, bear with me and please review the disclaimer at the beginning of this film if this is getting too far out there for you. The Rockefeller oil industry claimed that all of the oil used every day by the 10 billion people since its alleged discovery in China in 347 AD is all from the fossils of buried dinosaurs. If this sounds ridiculous to you, it's probably because it is ridiculous. How many alleged dinosaur skeletons would it take to run all of the cars, trains, planes, and machines using oil worldwide just today alone? Have you ever seen a skeleton dug up in a puddle of its own oil? Now let's look at hydrated carbon in trees, or carbohydrates. A carbohydrate is a biomolecule consisting of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms, usually with a hydrogen-oxygen ratio of 2 to 1, or H2O, water. Non-structural carbohydrates are an important backbone of life strategies for long-living trees. In addition, Species-specific sugar alcohols can be found. Woody axes, or branches in the trunks of trees, are not only involved in long-distance transport bark of carbon. The living wood tissues, sapwood, and the bark are also the major storage compartments of carbon. Carbohydrates sustain the formation of phenolic extractives, components which ascribe for the natural durability of wood. As roots of most trees are part of plant-microbe interactions, or mycorrhiza, their carbohydrate status and the role of sugars in this interaction is also of importance. Enteric fermentation is a digestive process by which carbohydrates, such as in dead tree roots, are broken down by microorganisms into simple molecules for absorption into the bloodstream of animals and just happens to be the third biggest source of methane emission, right after landfills and natural gas. Later, petroleum, burning of agricultural residues like trees, and silicone carbide production are the other biggest causes of methane gas emissions. But if oil doesn't come from dinosaur fossils, then what is it? Where does it really come from? And why is there so much of it underground? Kerogen is a fossilized material in shale and sedimentary rock that yields oil upon heating. It is organic matter that is insoluble or cannot be dissolved in organic solvents like benzene and it is the precursor of both oil and natural gas like methane. But then, what organic material in these rocks, if not dinosaurs? 
Sedimentary rocks are formed from pre-existing rocks or pieces of once living organisms. You mean like giant fallen trees and titans? They form from deposits on the Earth's surface and are also found deposited in lakes and oceans. Again, kerogen is a solid, insoluble organic matter in sedimentary rocks consisting of an estimated 10 to the 16th power tons of carbon and is the most abundant source of organic, meaning once living, compounds on Earth, exceeding the total organic content of current living matter by 10,000 fold. Well then, what organic matter was once 10,000 fold more abundant than it is currently, if not trees? In the leading lamestream science theory, Dead organic material accumulates on the bottom of oceans, riverbeds, and swamps, mixing with the mud and sand. Over time, more sediment piles on top, and the resulting heat and pressure, you know, all of that heat in the wet, cold oceans, riverbeds, and swamps, transforms the organic layer into a dark and waxy substance known as kerogen. Left alone, the kerogen molecules eventually crack, breaking up into shorter and tighter molecules composed almost solely of carbon and hydrogen atoms. Depending on how liquid or gaseous the mixture is, it will turn into either petroleum or natural gas. We are told that underground coal seam fires, like the Burning Mountain in Australia, can burn for at least as long as 6,000 years. At Germany's Brandenburg, literally burning mountain in German, the coal has been on fire since 1688. Kevin Krajic wrote in the Smithsonian Magazine, even more remarkably, ancient subterranean fires shaped the very landscape of the West. Much of the landscape of the American West, its mesas and escarpments, is the result of vast ancient coal fires. Long before we began excavating coal to burn in our factories, coal seams have been hidden rivers of underground flame, usually dormant, but occasionally destructive. Most of our active volcanoes are underwater. What if what we call plate tectonics are actually massive ancient underground tree root systems of a scale we cannot possibly fathom? and volcanic activity is nothing more than what we call coal seam fires in these old tree root systems, still burning from the kerogen, oil, and natural gases like methane, still being produced down below us. As we discussed in the previous three parts, all of these stories and events of land masses sinking or rising out of the ocean are all accompanied by some major volcanic event and or a giant earthquake of some kind. Yet, we always seem to ignore the proverbial elephant in the room. Is it just possible that instead of alleged moving tectonic plates causing this phenomenon, the rising forces of trapped underground gas pockets contained inside enormous ancient tree root systems could be holding up entire islands or continents at their base, and the explosion, leaking, and or collapse of these systems over time could lead to the sinking or rising of land masses? As we pondered earlier, do ocean levels rise, or do land masses rise and sink in stable ocean levels? Why are the ocean salt water and the land masses filled with fresh water? If there were giant trees and the tabletop mountains, mesas, and plateaus are tree stumps, where then are the rest of these alleged gigantic trees? What are continents and what holds them together? Well, we're going to take this absurd theory one step further and get into exploring those exact answers in the next part. Bro, you, you promised, you promised the, origins the origins of racism, of racism and anti-Semitism anti in part, part five. five. Don't you blaspheme in here. Don't you blaspheme in here. Indeed, Moses and Bernie, there's a reason you can't get nominated. And in order to keep my word, 
Stay tuned first for part 4B, the literal world tree we just may live on.